Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Seva, brought to you by Heart and Soul Broadcasting Services. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the cessation app. Today I'm in conversation with Rockwell Chinono, award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker. If you enjoy this conversation, please subscribe, like, and share. Enjoy this thought-provoking conversation. <music> Opal Chino, no. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Second time around. And what I like about this, this is face-to-face, -face, not Zoom, like we did during COVID time. That's true. That's very true. At Purple, last time you were here, um, you had not been arrested. And then you got arrested. And a lot of people, uh, there was a sense out there that this show had contributed to your arrest. Do you want to clear the air? that I didn't cause you, I wasn't part of you getting arrested? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. I, I don't think uh, you had any contribution to my arrest. My arrest was premeditated by the um, by the state and by ZANU-PF. Um, the, the warning shot came when Patrick Shinamasa, who was then the acting spokesperson for ZANU-PF, had a press conference where he was uh, asked by Blessed Nklang about my case. And um, he s mentioned me by name and warned me and said I should stop what I'm doing. Uh, I'm going to get into uh, hot soup if I continue doing what I'm doing. So they had already planned that. Uh, I think I think your show only helped people to understand uh, the substance of the reporting that I was doing on the looting of public funds related to COVID-19. Mm. And then when, when we were, when we had that conversation, I asked you, were you scared, were you frightened that you might be arrested? And you made a very powerful uh, step, statement that you're not arrested. I just want us to play the video so that people get a sense of what it is that you, that you said. Are you, are you, uh, do you feel safe? You, we've had uh, um, Patrick Chinamasa calling a, a press conference and saying, unkind words about you. We've had uh, the ZANU-PF uh, youths uh, doing the same thing. Do you feel safe? You know, Trevor, I've reached a point where I say to myself, when I'm scared, terrified, or living in fear, it makes no difference. Uh, because if someone wants to get to me, uh, whether I'm bold or whether I'm scared, they'll still get to me. So I've decided to say, I'll just soldier on. Nobody's safe at the moment if you criticize the government. So that's why you said you were not you were not scared. Interestingly, as I was watching that video again, I remembered how scared I was when I got arrested uh, the first time. Uh, I'd gone to Namibia uh, for um, uh, for a media conference, and I came back and I got home and I told that they were looking for me. I ran away, uh, and uh, eventually they caught up with me. Now that you've been in prison, what do you do? You, are you scared of being arrested, or if you've been immunized? No, I'm not scared of being arrested at all. Um, as I mentioned last time, uh, you know, my reporting as a journalist is uh, part of my work, and it's uh, protected by the constitution. Uh, the people who carry the burden. Um, of arresting me and jailing me is the state and the ruling party ZANU-PF, which has captured state institutions and uses them to punish journalists who are exposing corruption or who are covering things that they don't want covered. It's happened again to Blessed Mklanga and uh, uh, his colleague. Um, when I was first arrested, I, I knew that they were coming because not everyone in the system agrees with what's happening. The system uh, is not homogeneous, and I always tell people that don't insult everybody because not everyone agrees with what's happening. So a day before, I was warned that they were coming. Um, I was actually not staying at home. Um, I was I was staying at the village. So when I was told that they were coming, I made sure that I was home so that when they came, uh, they would they would get me there. 
the idea being that uh, when you run away, it seems like uh, you've committed a crime. Um, but I understand why you ran away because there's also the fear factor. But in my case, I just thought, you know what, this thing must come to a head. Uh, let them do what they want to do um, because they will do it anyway. Even if I run away, they will yeah. catch up with me. And um, <clears throat> I think the biggest problem, <clears throat> of course, for everyone around me was the fear factor. People were worried. Um, my sisters were saying, you know, don't say these things. Look what has happened now. Um, the family does <clears throat> pressure, isn't it? The extended family and friends. Indeed, the extended family feels the pressure and sometimes you feel very sorry for them because it's like you're watching a movie. Uh, these people are, are, are in panic mode and you're not um, because you know exactly how the movie is going to play out. You know that you're going to go to court, magistrate's court, you're going to be denied bail. You know that you're going to go to the high court. Uh, you know that if you're going to get bail, it can only be in the high court. You know that if there is an instruction, even at the high court, you're not going to uh, you're not going to get bail. Uh, like in the case of Job Scala, which is absolutely ridiculous, and his colleague it's terrible. Yes, where they are, they are, they are. There's a brazen. Um, uh, I mean, they don't care about what the world thinks. Uh, the Constitution clearly said that bail is a is a right. Um, and, and they've been denied bail. Job Scala, Godfrey Stolle, and the other 15 Yatsime uh, supporters of Triple C, they've been denied bail. And um, what is the point? What do you think the government's trying to achieve? Because from what you're saying, they don't care about what the world thinks. Are they clearly damaging brand Zimbabwe? They're damaging the name of this country. Um, forget about Zana PF. I don't think they care anymore about the damage that they're inflicting on the uh, name Zimbabwe, brand Zimbabwe. Uh, I don't care. I don't think. I don't think they care anymore about what the world thinks of them because if they did, some of the things that they're doing are absolutely ridiculous. Uh, even Mugabe didn't do some of the things, and Mugabe is the standard for bad governance everywhere in the world. Uh, you mention Mugabe, the first thing that comes to mind is bad government governance. And the fact that when they came into power through the military coup, we thought that they were going to be different. They were, and they had an opportunity to do things differently. Now, my my theory is that they are naturally incompetent um, because they could be making more money than they're making today if they were doing things the right way. They would not be uh, they, they they would not be inflicting uh, damage to brand Zimbabwe and even brands and OPF and themselves in their individual capacities if they were doing the right thing. So I don't think there's a normal human being who would want to inflict pain on themselves if they know any other way. So I think uh, uh, the, 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 the whole thing is uh, angered by incompetence. Um, corruption is there, looting of public funds is there, the plundering of the natural resources are, is there, but I think there are many states that we can uh, look at where all those things happen, but because there's a, an element of competence in, in how the government is being run, things are not as bad as they are in Zimbabwe. I mean, we don't have water in our homes. We don't have medication in hospitals. No electricity, no, no roads. The list is long. So I, I, I shared with you, you know, that um, when they were looking for me, I, I, was, I was afraid. When the, finally they got me, um, initially I was, I didn't know what was going to happen to me in prison and so forth and detention, went inside. Um, when I came out, I was a changed person. I was no longer scared. They'd, they'd hit their best shot and there was nothing, what else could they do to me? Um, so, so being in police detention actually changed me. It made me stronger. It made me actually realize that, oh, maybe, maybe I'm fighting for a, for a good cause. If I wasn't convinced, now this is the right time. This is the time. I mean, we talk about two decades ago, if not more, I mean, mm. it's been 30 years ago. Did prison change you? Did, you? did it change you? And if it did, how did it change you? Prison definitely changed me. Um, the first time when I was arrested on the 20th of July, uh, every process and procedure was new to me. 
I'd never been in police detention. I'd never been arrested my whole life. Uh, I'd never been in a court of law. I, I, I've never committed a crime which uh, required me to go and be tried. Um, I'd never been to prison. Um, so each step, uh, there was an element um, of anxiety because you don't know what the next step is. <clears throat> but the second time when I was arrested, after I exposed that Henrietta Rishwaya was going to get bail unopposed, and the third time when they arrested me um, in January 2021 for something that I had not done using a law that did not exist, I, I was not bothered at all. Okay. Yeah, I was not bothered at all. And, and I was not bothered because I now understood uh, that within the police service and within the prison service, uh, they are very good people in there. Um, and, and, and it became much easier to uh, understand that the fight against corruption, the fight against the looting of public funds, it's a fight that is not only benefiting those of us that are perceived to be middle class, mm -hmm. but it's actually helping uh, even civil servants, prison officers, because these prison officers and police officers would tell you their stories. Mm -hmm. They would tell you their suffering. Um, and and, and um, they would, uh, in, in so many cases, tell you about what's happening in their families. I mean, when I was at Chikurubi prison, uh, we were, of course, not eating uh, the food there. One, because uh, for security reasons. Yes. And second, because it was just badly cooked. Um, terrible, they, food. terrible food. They boil beans with water and they cook uh, sadza and they give them that sadza with uh, boiled beans and the the gravy or soup is the water, uh, and they just add salt. But the prison officers were eating that food, and some of them, if not most of them, they take uh, the beans back home. And they would explain to me that I'm taking these boiled beans home so that uh, my wife can then cook it and spice it properly, and then that's our dinner. So I realized that uh, these people that are looking after us are actually suffering as well and they understood our fight, that our fight is not about removing a government. Uh, our fight is about um, a fair society. Our fight is about asking a government not to steal public funds that are meant to protect the vulnerable in our society. You say it changed you. In what way? It changed me. I, I, I don't, I'm not scared anymore. As I said, the first time I was prepared, but there was an element of fear. But this time around, the second time, the third time, I was not, I was not bothered. Even I've just come back from from Europe where I was away for, for almost three months. And I was getting phone calls from people in the system to say, why don't you just stay there? You know, save yourself all this trouble. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not bothered. I've not committed any crime. Yeah. So if I've committed a crime and if they can prove uh, that I've committed a crime, then fair and fine, but I've not committed a crime. All these cases, the three cases, two of them have been thrown out by the High Court. I mean, the first one, the judge said that there's actually nothing before the court, and yet I spent 45 days in, in, in prison. And then they took the title deeds to my house, which they still have. They took my passport. I paid uh, $20,000 uh, as a uh, bill reconnaissance. And for, for something which a judge says is not even before me, he said, I would like to acquit this man, but I can't even acquit him because there's nothing before the court. Uh, you acquit where something has been put before the court, but as it is looking at these papers, there is nothing. And then the third case, the judge said, there is no such law under our statutes that law does not exist that you are saying you've used to charge this man. Uh, and, and, and the state didn't even bother to turn up for the hearing because they understood that they were persecuting me. I'm confused because I don't know when, when, I see, when I see you going to court and so forth, I'm like, is this still going to court? What's happening? So which, court, which case is now still alive? So I was arrested on the 3rd of November, 2020. Uh, after I'd practiced as a journalist, um, I, I published that um, Henrietta Rishwaya 
uh, who's, who's uh, 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 related to powerful uh, people in government, had been uh, given bail unopposed after she had been caught smuggling six kilograms of gold out of the country to Dubai. Um, when they came to my home, they said, we are arresting you for violating your bail conditions for the first matter. But when we go to the police station, some of them, they said, you know what? You've not committed any crime. We've just been told to scrap for something. So now we are going to say uh, you, you, you published the issue of Henrietta Rishwaya and that uh, because you published that issue, a, you, it's obstruction to justice. And I said, but I'm a journalist. Um, and I said, what I published about Henrietta Rishwaya is correct. And they said, look, we're taking instructions. Uh, interestingly, the first time when I was arrested, uh, I think that's why people made an inference that uh, Hopewell was arrested because he was in conversation with Trevor. It's, 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 I was telling them stories about the things that I've said in the past. And I said to them, even on in conversation with Trevor, I have said these things. Why is it an issue now when I've said these things? And so when one of the investigating officers was cornered by my lawyer, Beatrice Mtetwa, he then repeated what I had said, that he also said these things on Trevor, <laughs> on Trevor's show. <laughs> so the influence that was drawn was that he was arrested because he said, yeah, but, yeah. but in actual fact, this guy was cornered. And because I had told him about the things I had said on the show, he then just used it as a way to answer the question because he had no proper answers to give to Beatrice and Tetra. Tell me the... Obviously, the, the experience was terrible in prison. What, what stands out for you um, on, on two counts as the most terrible experience that you experienced, one, and two, what gave you hope when you in prison? I think the most difficult part for me when I was in prison was those around me, the other prisoners, because I was getting food from home um, and these other guys did not get food from home. They were eating the junk food that is being provided by the prison service. And it was very difficult at night because you have breakfast around 7, 8. Then you have lunch around 11. Uh, then you have your supper around 2. But I could not eat around those times because they were ridiculous times to be having supper at two. Um, so I would go upstairs when we are locked up and then I would have my supper, the normal time that I have supper. But it pained me so much uh, that I'm having this good food and all these guys are just looking. So eventually what would do with my co-accused Jacob Ngarivume and eventually with Job Scala when he jo joined us, would uh, take half of our food and then share it with all the prisoners in the, in, in, in the cell. That was very difficult. The second thing that was difficult for me personally was the fact that you are logged in at three and you are released um, at six in the morning and you are in this prison cell which does not have water, and there's an open toilet in there, uh, and people have no water, um, and people are sleeping on the floor. People actually sleep on the floor. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to understand how human beings can treat other human beings like that. Um, the most interesting thing when I was in prison was to notice that uh, there was once uh, facilities like beds that were provided for. You could see the marks of beds on the wall, that there was a bed here, 
but the state has failed so much that they can't provide beds, they can't provide water in the cells for these inmates uh, to use the toilet. There's no drinking water, so these inmates have to use jugs um, to get water outside. Sometimes the water is not even there, so they will take water from a disused uh, fish pond, um, and that's what they drink. Are you bitter? I'm, I'm not bitter at all. I'm not bitter at all. I have actually engaged my jailers, the people that I know were responsible for my uh, incarceration. Uh, they've spoken to me, uh, some direct, some indirectly, and um, I've made it absolutely clear to them that for me, it's never about myself. Uh, it's never about removing a government illegally, as they always happen about. It's about a fair society. I live a comfortable life. I can go and get employed anywhere in the world. In fact, I get job offers all the time. People think I'm mad to stay here. Uh, I get I get editors around the world calling me to say, why don't you come and run the Africa desk? I get calls from international uh, organizations asking me to do communications and things like that. And um, But I think that, you know, I, I was given so much by this country as I was growing up. I went to college. I did not pay school fees. Um, it was someone's taxes that were doing that. And I then went to Britain and America to study, came back, had a, a brilliant career. Um, and I think I, I have to give something uh, to this society because if we become selfish and forget about the society that gave us something, that's how societies get uh, uh, broken. And that's how societies are, are destroyed when people think about themselves only. And they don't think about the young boy who is in uh, in Shabalala, the young boy who is in Murewa or Lutito, the, the young boy in the township, the young girls who are being married off uh, when they are 14 years old. If we don't think about those people and don't use uh, our agents to make sure that we change society, then we, we become selfish. Hope, well, you, you've been very outspoken uh, on corruption, um, and on just the breakdown of uh, public services, roads, infrastructure, and, and, and so forth. Well, as you sit here, what's your sense? Are things getting worse? Are things getting better? Are you being vindicated? Do you feel that you're being outspoken is, 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 is causing some traction of some sort? The tragedy is that I've, I've been vindicated. That's the tragedy. I would have liked a situation where I'm not vindicated. It would have meant that things are getting better. Yeah. Um, we, we, we live in a country where there's no single radiotherapy cancer machine. I made a speech in Geneva about it um, at the UN. When I came back, I was lambasted by ZANU-PF and some elements in government, and they said I was a sellout. Um, they even lied that these machines are there and they are working, uh, yet people are dying every day. So the whole of Zimbabwe does not have a single working radiotherapy cancer machine, and it costs only $2 million to buy one. I thought somebody said there's one now. We don't have okay, a single no. one at all. The health minister went to parliament and said they are there, they are working. It's not true. They are not working. There's no single one. Um, Parinyatwa has got three. They are all not working. They haven't been working since last year. Um, Mpilo Hospital in Blauayo has got two. They are not working as well. Um, we live in a country where the biggest hospital, Salim Gabi Hospital, has got only one working maternity theater. Um, in, in total, it has got two maternity theaters. One is not working. Both maternity theaters were built in 1977 by Ian Smith. Um, and ZANU-PF as a government has not built a single maternity theater in 42 years at the biggest hospital in this country. And as a result, 2,500 Zimbabwean women die every year giving birth. Uh, to build a maternity theater, it costs about uh, 37,000 uh, US dollars. And uh, one land cruiser uh, would, would build 11 maternity theaters. 
and yet in government there are thousands of land cruisers. To tell me, uh, Popol, you're saying this is incompetence. Is this incompetence or they just don't care? I think... It was incompetence. You'd see an effort and uh, buildings would be falling over and that kind of stuff. But but nothing when nothing is being done, where are you seeing the poverty that you and I experience? Um, you know, the thing that breaks my heart every morning as I drive to this place is to see uh, the number of uh, men and women looking for firewood um, uh, and, and the desperate conditions that the majority of our citizens are in. That, to me, that doesn't look sound and look like it's incompetence. It just sounds like they don't care. Yeah, I think, I think they don't care. Uh, that's true. And, but I think they're also incompetent um, because the efforts, um, the comical efforts that you see them investing in point towards incompetence because if they knew how things were done, they would try and do the right thing. Because, for instance, um, <clears throat> the theatres are not working. Maternity theatres. The biggest hospital has got only one working theatre built in 1977. And people are having to give birth in makeshift theatres in Bari. What, does, what, what, what do ZANU-PF political elites do? They go to those makeshift maternity theatres and donate things. That's, that's, that's a level of incompetence. Uh, because if, if, if they were not incompetent or if they had good advisors, they would have said, no, these things that you want to donate to these makeshift uh, theatres, actually let's take them to the main hospital and make things work there so that these uh, uh, makeshift maternity theatres in Bara are not there. But, but for them, that's a solution. Uh, there's a crisis of bread. They will go and build those medieval uh, bakeries, and they say that is the solution. That to me is is a level of co incompetence, because uh, this country engages with China, and Zanu says uh, their friends, their real friends are, are, are China. In China, you can invest uh, one million in proper ovens, which they can distribute across the country and actually help them win votes. But because they are incompetent, they don't even know about those things. They want to win votes, so I don't think that they don't care to a point where they don't want to win votes. They just don't know. Because doing the right thing means you win votes. But if, if you don't even know what to do in order to win votes, uh, then it, it points towards incompetence. The other thing that you've been very outspoken about, actually I should say that in many cultures, Hopo Chinono sounds, walks like is the opposition, is the leader of the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, your voice reverberates. And on one, one thing that uh, it reverberates on is uh, the campaign register to vote. What's your sense of uh, are the young people coming out to vote? Are people responding to the call of it or call to action to register and vote? I think in spaces where people like myself and others have been able to influence, people are coming out to vote. But I think the opposition needs to mount a voter registration campaign. It hasn't done that yet. Uh, it's being done ad hoc. But uh, I hope that the main opposition leader, Nelson Shamisa, is going to come out and uh, mount a voter registration campaign because he's the most popular politician in Zimbabwe. And that popularity should be used to harness uh, the, the voter registration campaign to make sure that young people uh, vote. Young people love Nelson Shamisa. And, and um, so it requires him, again, to use that popularity uh, to make sure that they are registered to vote. The, the, the issue of registering to vote is so tragic because, for instance, in 2013, 
uh, only 21 people out of every 100 that were eligible to register to vote and vote bothered to do so. Um, which means that uh, 79 people did not bother to go and uh, register to vote out of every uh, 100 or did not bother to go and actually vote out of every 100. Now, what that does, what people don't understand is that ZANU-PF uh, and, and the related institutions that are used to manipulate uh, the voter process and to rig the elections takes advantage of uh, that disconnect. Those 79 people allow ZANU-PF to rig an election because, as they say, you might not vote, but you are going to vote anyway because someone will vote for you. Now, let's assume that uh, 90 people had bothered to register to vote and actually went along to vote in 2013. 90 out of every 100, that's 90 percent. It meant that ZANU-PF would only have 10 percent to play around with. And you can't rig an election with 10 percent. Now, the tragedy that we have is the youth have not been receiving messages of hope, of inspiration. It's okay for me to say that ZANU-PF steals public funds. It's corrupt. All the ills of the ZANU-PF regime, they are well documented and known. But what is important is for me and everyone else who's looking for change to explain to these young people what change will look like. You've got to inspire them. I've written an article, uh, I wrote it in 2019, about Kaliba for young people where I was explaining to them that Kaliba is dead, it's a dead asset at the moment, but we can turn it around by removing taxes, making it a tax-free zone, uh, saying any Zimbabwean and any foreigner who wants to come and invest in Kariba will not pay taxes for a period of five years or 10 years. And that way you create jobs, you make Kariba the nutrition city of uh, the nutrition capital of, of the continent, which means Kapenda, uh, planes are flying out every day with Kapenda uh, to different parts of the, of the continent. Trucks are going, to Congo, they are going many parts of the continent. Um, but that requires leadership to sell that vision so that the youth can visualize what the future will look like. I went further and talked about casinos and said that uh, you can turn Kariba uh, into a hub where the rich in Africa can come and, and, and uh, they have casinos at the weekend. Uh, you can also start a boat building business there because you've got the biggest man-made lake in the world. What it does is that when they come, they buy boats. They don't take those boats away. They leave them there. It creates another source of employment for for locals. You have mechanics who fix those boats. Well, but there's a, there's a disconnect here. I, I hear you saying uh, the young people love Nelson Chamisa. You are saying that young people are not hearing messages of hope. You are saying the opposition is not as, is not out to campaign. What is happening there? What's the problem? I'm 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 not sure. I'm not sure what is happening because uh, just yesterday, I dedicated the whole day to to talk about the track record of. Um, leaders in Triple C who were in the government of national unity in, in between 2009 and 2013. And I talked about what Tendai Biti did. I talked about what Chamisa did as ICT minister. I talked about what Deft Coulter did as education minister. I talked about what Martininga did as minister for constitutional affairs. Uh, I talked about how SIM cards uh, uh, fell from $200 to 50 cents. And you should go and see the retweets there in the thousands. And I was talking about things that inspire young people, messages of hope, to say this is what your future could be like. So why is the main opposition not putting together a message that gives hope 
so that people go out and register. Because the the I understand there are stumbling blocks towards registering. But again, to your point, if ninety percent of the people pitched up and wanted to to register, it would become a huge story. I know we've seen that that happening, but I get the sense that there's something that's not happening to cause the excitement amongst the young people. And hook it up, I've actually heard people saying register to vote what for i mean that's mm. disconcerting in this time and age it is um and i think as a society uh the 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 the, the biggest drawback that now affects our society is that we always look for excuses for not doing something instead of looking for solutions of fixing a problem like that so when you say zanu pf is putting stumbling blocks I say, let's not mourn about it. Let's do something about it. Let's go out there and show the world that the stumbling blocks are there. I've always said, yes, the courts are captured, but you cannot make your case to a captured Sadak or captured AU when you don't have the material to say, I went to court on this day, this is what they said. And the same thing applies to Zek. If it makes it difficult for our young people to register to vote, the opposition must 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 uh, create a file which they can then use. I've spoken, Trevor, to government ministers in South Africa. And when I was in Europe, I was meeting so many political uh, leaders in Europe, in France, in Britain. And when I went to New York, um, you know, I was meeting all these people. And they were saying, uh, but... What are they doing about this? And this is what is the opposition doing about it? About it, yes. And I think again, um, we've created a culture of toxicity where when someone asks that question, it seems like you're attacking the opposition. When someone asks that question of Zano PF, it seems you're attacking Zano PF. Whereas what you're trying to say is let's fix this problem. Because what's going to happen, Trevor? It's a heart attack or, 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 or a heartbreak, either of the two or both, um, in, in 2023. I don't see um, change happening unless we do the things that will make change happen. And one of those key pillars is voter registration. The second thing is the voter's role. In fact, an election is the voter's law and voter registration. Now, if people are not registered um, and, and, and if the voter's law is not cleaned up, then it's the same old stuff of, you know, the election is rigged, we go to court, we get the same result. So let me give you some tragic figures. Between 2018 and, um, and today, almost 1.8 million uh, young Zimbabweans turned 18, which means they they were now able to vote. They could not vote in August, in July 2018, because they were young. Because they were young, but 1.8 of them can now vote between 2018 and today. Less than 150,000 have registered to vote. Now, um, you've got to subtract the 70,000 from that 150,000, the 70,000 that are dead, that have been cleared of the voters' roll. So in terms of numbers, we are not doing well. People are not registered to vote. And if people do not register to vote, there's not going to be any change that's going to happen in this country. Zanu PF will rig the election. The world will complain about it, and then they will move on. So my call to opposition leaders is that you've got to register your people to vote. You've got to make sure that the voters' roll is cleaned. You've got to make sure that you stop making excuses about why things can be done. You should start creating solutions. The solutions are there. You should implement them. Show leadership. That is what is required. Wow. Now that's a powerful statement coming from Hopeful. Before I, I say, before I ask uh, that question, that uh, sometimes I get the sense that you're the leader of the opposition. I must ask you this, this question, Hopewell. Why does it have to take Hopewell to say the things that the people in the opposition should be saying? Why should, does it have to take hope well to labor to inspire the young people to vote and not 
the opposition, which is supposed to, I nearly said structures, but I'm not going to go there, which is supposed to have the means to mobilize people to register to vote and inspire them. What's happening in the opposition? I think there's a, there's a sense of, uh, of fear and also incompetence. Um, the fear factor is derived from the fact that people like Hopewell, Job Scala, and Gary Vume, you know, are locked up. <clears throat> and, and some of the opposition leaders, they see Fadzaima are in prison. So they are afraid to say, if we speak out, if we talk about these things, um, we might be locked up as well. And the second aspect is of incompetence. Our politics has never been based on ideas and competence. Uh, we political parties when they are formed, they end up aping uh, the 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 cultural okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you look at at at, at MDC, uh, Shanghai uh, refused to honor a democratic vote, resulting in a split between him and Walshman Nube. Uh, if you look at how people like uh, Elton Mangoma, they were beaten up. People like Trudy Stevenson were beaten up. Uh, that shows a, a society which is aping a ruling party. And if the ruling party can do this, we can do it as well. So change should mean that we do things differently. Uh, and, 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 and so there's, there's that element of incompetence where the brave are the ones that go into politics. Uh, the, those, the men and women of ideas are scared of going into politics. Because if you look at the names that have been called, all based on lies, I've been called a homosexual. A I've been called a sellout. I've been called all sorts of names. I've been said I work with ED. I've been said I work with Chiwenga. Uh, and even some people in the opposition, some leaders in the opposition have said, I work with Chuenga. Wow. You know, a man that I only met twice in my whole life. Why, why would the people in the opposition call you those names? Is it because of my own reading that uh, Hopewell is now the leader of the opposition? I think it's based on um, an idea that you are encroaching into our space. Uh, and also, I think it's also based on the close proximity that I have with some of the uh, uh, leadership in the opposition. So some feel threatened that I'm getting close to the leaders and and maybe I'm influencing them and some think that I want positions. And um, to his credit, no such has always said to me, I mean, so what if you want positions? Um, so we, we need to change that culture, Trevor, because uh, I have been going around um, different cities and encouraging people of means and people who are educated, who have good skills to consider running for councils. Because councils have collapsed mainly because of ZANU-PF's behavior, but also because of a certain level of incompetence within the, the, the opposition itself. Now, if you send somebody who does not know what a spreadsheet is to council, you don't expect like any... We have now. I mean, the majority of the people we have in council and in parliament don't have the skills that would make them competent if they got into office. Yes. And, and, and uh, I spoke to a, one of the biggest businessmen in Zimbabwe who said to me, I don't even know, I've never met my MP, he's been MP for 15 years, I'm, I'm one of the richest men in this country. I would have expected him to come to me to talk about what they plan to do and the financial hurdles they are facing so that we can assist. So when politics becomes a job, as it has become in Zimbabwe, it, it's, 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 it, those that want to keep it as a job will push out those that want to bring ideas. At the expense of the country. At the expense of the country, yes. And I hope that <clears throat> this time, since Nelson Chamisa said uh, they are not going to have primary elections, people are going to be chosen by their communities, I hope that that process will bring out good candidates. But there's still a lot of work to, to do. I, I, I've, I've got liberties to share this mm -hmm. because she, she won't mind. Yeah. <clears throat> I've been trying to convince Sister Dangarembwa 
to go into council. Because I say to a parliament doesn't matter, Tizi. The real deal is in council. Whole thing. Yes. And Tizi said politics in Zimbabwe is an attractive. You know, first of all, when I said this, the, there was a group of middle class people and intellectuals and business people, and they laughed. They said, ah, you want to, to go into council? I said, yes. It's easier for all our libraries to get books from abroad if it is a council in there. She's got something to offer. It's easier for all our um, uh, institutions that require refurbishment to get it if we have got people who have uh, an international outlook. Uh, if, if you, Trevor Ngube, were a counselor for your area in Umskindo, uh, it's easy for you to pick up the phone and speak to Ramaphosa, who you have spoken to, and ask for certain things that do not even require the endorsement of the Zimbabwean government, and you will get them. <music>